Okay, for our visitors who have been reflecting together on the persecuted church around the world and what's going on in certain parts of the world where Christians are paying a very dear price for their faith. Last week we were looking at Hindu extremism in India. Today I want to move to a different part of the world and particularly to look at Syria. But before we do that, let me share this story with you. I've called, we've titled this series, Stories from the Frontline. And I'll be sharing three stories with us today. And so please watch this short video with me. Down through the centuries, the sands of time have shifted, exposing a cruel and barbaric persecution of the Christian church in the Middle East. Beheadings, crucifixions, rape, and displacement are reminiscent of the persecuted church of the first century in the 21st century. Persecution can go from being arrested, believing in what you believe in, it can go even worse of killing, of beheading. Our weapons as Christians is to love them and to forgive whatever they did for us. The more they are persecuted, the more they love. It's so encouraging and it's worth everything. Our life, our possession, everything. As a church, we think this is a time of prayer, this is a time of waiting for a great revival, this is a time of serving God with all our hearts, this is a time to partner together to serve the Lord. It's very important that the persecuted church knows that there is other churches, other Christians all over the world praying for them. <laughs> Pray for a revival, pray for visitations, pray for God to show himself, pray for many people to see visions and dreams about Jesus, pray for the walls to fall so the light will come and, and the chains will fall, pray for freedom for people to choose and to know more about the eternal life. While ISIS and other militant extremists try to silence their voices, the spirit continues to move. In the face of such persecution, the body of Christ needs an army of prayer warriors, men and women willing to make sacrifices, to rebuild and restore, to give humanitarian aid, and to raise international awareness and prayer. These will be the acts of love and service that Jesus commended when he said, Whatsoever you did for the least one of these, you did for me. There is a region in the world that extends from the west coast of Africa through to Japan and goes from latitude 10, which is about the northern part of Kenya, to latitude 40, which cuts through the top of Turkey and through countries like Spain, that is called the 1040 window. You need to know about the 1040 window because this window includes countries like, you know, the countries in the Sahara, in North Africa, the countries of the Middle East, the countries of lower Europe, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, China, North Korea, Burma, Thailand, Vietnam, and Japan. And there are four things that you need to know about the 1040 window. The first is about two-thirds of the world's population lives in that window. The second 
is that this is a region that contains some of the world's poorest countries where there is great poverty. The third is that most of the unreached people groups of the world, people who have never heard about Jesus Christ, they do not know of the grace of God, they do not know that our Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross for them. This region contains the highest numbers. Now, we said last week that India, North India, is probably the most unreached area of the world when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ. But this window contains the bulk of the world's people who do not know Christ and the love that he showed on the cross. There are four great religions in this region. The bulk of this 1040 window is Islamic. The second part is Hindu, northern India. The third part is there are quite a number of countries there that are Buddhist. And then the fourth are countries like um, China, where there is no state religion and they are considered to be atheists. Many of the countries and governments in the 1040 window are formally or informally opposed to Christian work of any kind within their borders. My passport indicates that I'm a pastor. Whenever I go for a visa to go to a place like India, they make me sign that I will not proselytize anyone or share about my Christian faith with anyone. And it's a little harder for me to go in because they recognize me to be a Christian worker. It's not only that the most unreached peoples of the world live in the 1040 window, but also that the most persecution takes place in this little window. Persecution in the Middle East is even more intense than in India. We talked about the rating that countries are given um, concerning persecution, the top rating being a 7 out of 7. Countries like Iran, probably the most repressive country in the world that persecutes a church more than any other is North Korea. Iran following quickly behind it. Burma is a third country. Many of the countries in the 1040 window, at least in the Middle East, are about a six, maybe a five in terms of their persecution, except now the country of Syria and what's happening because of the war here. And so persecution in the Middle East is more intense than in India. Islam believes that Jesus Christ is one of the prophets of God, but he is not the greatest prophet. Instead, Muhammad is the last and the greatest prophet according to Islam. Islam is a jihadist religion with a core belief that only Muslims know the truth about God and that the whole world needs to come and be Muslim to become Muslim or alternatively to be killed. A good Muslim does jihad, which means that they will seek to convert other people and if those peoples will not convert, then they will persecute them. In Christianity, we talk about two types of Christians. And this will give you a little bit of an understanding about what's going on when you look at, you know, Islam in general. We talk about two sorts of Christians. First are those that we call nominal Christians. And by that, we mean people who are Christian by name only, nominal. And, you know, these are people who have a Christian name. When they fill a form, a government form or any other sort of form, and there's a question of what is your religion, they'll write Christian in there. They don't necessarily go to church, probably have never really read the Bible, but they grew up in a Christian tradition. They were probably baptized when they were kids, and for all reasons and purposes, they are Christian. But it's by name only. They don't accept Jesus Christ as the only way to God. They probably don't know what salvation is about and what the cross of Jesus Christ is about. They don't read their Bible in any sort of regular fashion. And really, they're just Christian by name. And then we talk about those who know Christ as their Lord and Savior, those that we call born again, those that understand what Jesus did on the cross as being for them so that they can have a relationship with God. Those that believe the Bible 
and believe that our lives should be aligned according to the Bible, and they take it seriously. They'll read it on a regular basis. When they worship, it's not just a matter of singing songs. It is a matter of being in the presence of God and worshiping the living God. Those are what we call the born-again Christians. They will do everything they can, as you and I will do, to share their faith with others and to bring them into a loving relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe, maybe 80% or 90% of Christians around the world are nominal Christians. And maybe only about 10, 20% of Christians around the world are born-again Christians. Very, very serious about their faith and about walking with God. The same is true with Islam. There are many Muslims who are just, you know, this is their religion. They are nominal in their faith. They are peace-loving Muslims. They just want to live their lives without interference from others. They are not trying to convert anyone. They read the Quran and its teachings, but they don't really follow it. The, the women don't necessarily wear a hijab. The men don't necessarily pray five times a day. But they do go to the mosque on occasion. They will adhere to the teachings of the Quran. And uh, maybe they make up about 80% of Muslims. They are nominal Muslims. If they fill out a form, they will say that they are Muslim. And they do know a little about their faith. But if you really question them, they don't know too much. But then there are those who consider themselves true Muslims. They believe in the Quran passionately. They will die for their faith and even become suicide bombers, considering it an honor to die in the service of Allah. They stick very closely to the Quran. And one of the things that the Quran teaches is jihad. Convert the infidels or kill them. 20% of Muslims would be true Muslims in this sense. We like to call them Muslim extremists. But if you were to call them that, then you would call born-again Christians Christian extremists. They are not extremists as far as they are concerned. They're just trying to live out their faith and to be true Muslims. We talk about Muslim youth being radicalized, but in truth, they're just being serious about their faith and beginning to obey the Quran. Most Muslims would disown ISIS and Boko Haram and Al-Shabaab as crazy, as extremist, as going off the charts. But if you ask one of the ISIS soldiers or ask one of the Boko Haram soldiers, they will tell you that they are the true Muslims and the others are not. One of the hot points of persecution in the world today is Syria. Because of ISIS and because of the rebels who are fighting the Assad government, who are determined to remove Christians from the Middle East and declare the Middle East, or at least this part of Syria, a caliphate. That's what ISIS wants to do. Or alternatively, as a nation under the Sharia law, which is what many of the rebels would like to do. Many Christians are being killed, beheaded, displaced. Women have been captured and sold to the slave market as sex slaves. And you know the reality is many of us do not understand that there are more slaves in the world today than there ever was during the slave trade of black men and women from Africa being taken to the Americas, being taken up north into Europe and Saudi Arabia. There are more slaves in the world today than there was at the height of the transatlantic slave trade. It's estimated that about 11 million Africans were exported to the Americas and into the Northern Hemisphere as slaves when the slave trade was taking place 300, 400 years ago. But today, it's estimated that there are about 28 million slaves around the world. Many of these are women who have been forced to become sex slaves and this is happening right now to Syrian Christians in Syria because of ISIS. 
Many are children in indentured bondage where they were exchanged by their parents to pay for a debt and they will remain as slaves for the rest of their lives. There are those who work in sweatshops who are trafficked with the promise of freedom and instead they found themselves in bondage. There are Africans in places like the Congo, children who are being used to mine rare earth substances that are used in our mobile phones and they go down into the pits to mine this stuff and this will be their life for the rest of their lives dying in those places slaves in Saudi Arabia and in the Arabic countries there are more slaves today in the world than at any other time in history over twice as many as the transatlantic slave trade and Syrian Christians have been forced, particularly the women, into sex slavery when they will not recant their faith. Syria had one of the oldest Christian churches and peoples in the world, a church that dates back to about 100 years after the time of Jesus Christ. Today there are hardly any Christians left in Syria because of ISIS. Many have lost their lives or run away to Turkey and to neighboring countries or are trying to migrate into Europe, some of them being trafficked with the promise of freedom. You've been reading about this in the papers. The countless number of people who have tried to go through Greece into Europe or alternatively overland into Europe and the difficult conditions that they find themselves in. Europe has been overwhelmed by Syrians running away from Syria itself. The countries of Lebanon and Jordan and, and uh, Turkey have been overwhelmed by the number of Syrians who have left Syria and are living in deplorable IDP camps or refugee camps, much like we saw here in Kenya during our clashes in 2008. I believe it's an estimate of over four or maybe five million people have left Syria over the last couple of years because of this war in Syria and the rising up of ISIS. About two-thirds of Syria's population is now in migration within the country or outside of the country. The reality on the ground is that very few Christians remain in Syria anymore. There are about two million when this war broke out. Today, maybe less than a third are still in the country. And those who have managed to escape are living in very, very difficult circumstances somewhere in the Middle East or alternatively on their way to Europe. It's a very high price to pay for one's faith. I want to show you a video of what it means to be a Syrian Christian today. We were praying for revival, believing God would do a big work in Syria. Then the war came. Now the terrorists are attacking Christian homes, churches, and even our children. Their goal is to empty Syria of its Christians. We hate the spirit of Islam that is destroying our country. But we love our Muslim neighbors. They come to us and say, in the name of our God, terrorists rape and kill. Where is God? We tell them about Jesus, and many are coming to know him. Still others say, we are like living in hell. One day, while I was praying, I asked God what he would have me do to be his witness. But he only asked me, will you give me your life? As I prayed, I understood he wanted all of me. And I said yes, 
If the time came, I was willing to die for Jesus. The next day, while I was praying, I asked God again what he would have me do. This time, he asked me, are you willing to give me your husband's life? It is not easy to be ready to die. My husband and I prayed about this together. We said yes to God. The third day was the most difficult. On this day, God asked me if I was willing to give up my children's lives. The terrorists know who we are and that we share Jesus with Muslims. It is not safe for our family. My husband and I prayed and fasted, and together we agreed. God gave us our precious children. He has the freedom to take them back. When we agreed to put our children on the altar, I knew I had to tell them the truth. I told them that it was possible that men with swords may come through our door, men who didn't know Jesus. They may say bad things to us and try to force us to convert to Islam. But no matter what they say, we should not answer them. We should only tell them that Jesus loves them and that we forgive them. I told them that we might see some blood and have some pain, but it would only be for a little while. that we should just close our eyes. And when we open them, we will be with Jesus. Am I a good mother? Do you have to tell my children such things? I also told them that as long as God wants us to be safe, we will be safe, that He is in control. Even during the bloodshed, during the killing, he is carrying our future. This is what it means to be a Christian in Syria. Imagine trying to explain to your children what would happen if the extremists came to your home. Part of the reason why the persecution of Christians in Syria has been so intense is because they were historically caught between a rock and a hard place. When the war began, they recognized that they would not find peace and shelter, they would not be accepted under the rebels who were fighting the Assad government. And so they stood on the side of the government. But then for that reason, they were seen to be collaborators with the government. And now they're persecuted not just for their faith, but because the rebels would say that Christians collaborate with the government, with the enemy. And so the rebels target them for these two reasons. And ISIS has intensified that even more under jihad. But for all the persecution Christians go through in Muslim lands, that is not the full story. Because the extremism of ISIS has generated a new crisis for many nominal Muslims. And it is a crisis of, if this is what it means to be a true Muslim, I don't know that I want to be a Muslim at all. And there is a new generation of people that are now being called Muslim atheists, who do not believe anymore, and in this sense have opened up their lives to ask a question, is there a God, is there a true God, and who is he? Because this cannot be it. It is said now that even though there are very few Christians left in Iran anymore because of the intense persecution, 
that Iran is one of those countries where there is a revival going on. Many, many people converting to become Christians. Algeria in North Africa, many, many converts there into Christianity. Afghanistan is said to be going through a revival. And there are, even among the Syrian refugees, many who are now converting to become Christians because of what they have seen happening through ISIS and the extremists there. The amazing thing about this too is that many of these who convert, it wasn't somebody who went up to them and shared the gospel with them. Many would say that they had a dream, they saw a white light, and there was a man who spoke to them coming out of this light, who told them to go and read the Bible, or who told them to go to a certain place and meet a certain man, or who told them to go to a church, or who even told them that he is Jesus Christ. And they accepted and converted to now follow the way of the Christian people. And it's not direct evangelism that is going on. It's miracles that are happening. There are thriving churches in the Middle East in the midst of persecution. One of those churches is a church called Kassel El Debara, Kassel Debara Church in Cairo. It is said to be the largest evangelical um, church in the Middle East. And they have been coordinating resources and help for the Christians, the Syrian Christians in Jordan, in Turkey, and in Lebanon who are in the camps. And they have appealed to churches around the world to please help. Just yesterday, somebody told me something that I think is worth uh, repeating. They said there are three types of missionaries. There are those missionaries who go with their feet and go into new lands and new territories to, pre to preach the good news of Jesus Christ. And then there are those missionaries who go on their knees because they pray for those who are going on their feet. And then there are those who go with their hands because they give towards those who are going into the Middle East and into other places where Christ's name is yet to be known. I want to come back to you good people and say, I'd like us to respond to the Syrian crisis, to our brothers and sisters who are in these camps, who are still in the country, or alternatively who are migrating to Europe to try and begin a new life, but it's a very difficult life that even though we see ourselves as having little, we don't know what we can share, nevertheless, even if it is a sip of cold water, not enough to quench one's thirst, but at least a lying that there is the opportunity to have a sip of cold water, we can do something. So here's what I want to instruct us to do. Those of us who will go on our knees, and this week, our focus in prayer is on Syria. That's what in your prayer, is in your prayer shield this week. All focused on Syria. Please remember to pray for our brothers and sisters in Syria. And do not undermine prayer. I had several of you call me this week and say, can we do more than just pray? It's not just prayer. Prayer is powerful. The Bible says that the prayers of a righteous man affecteth much. And God is able to do miracles because we prayed. And so do not belittle prayer. Your time, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, it is powerful before the heavens. And that's what our brothers and sisters are asking for. In all the time that I have had opportunity to be in these discussions, I've not heard anybody ask for money. They ask for prayer more than anything else. But then we can go with our feet also. Because Castle de Barra Church has asked and appealed for people who would go and go into Jordan and go into Lebanon and go into Turkey to be in the camps, to care for the children, to care for the sick, and to be present. The ministry of presence that you cared enough to come. We were not abandoned by the worldwide church, but you came and you ministered to us. And they are coordinating that if we can give them people who are willing to go, then they will coordinate what it will take to go into those places. This is not in the war zone, it's outside the war zone, and we can go and help there. And I believe that sub-Saharan Africa needs to be present and visible even in that place. 
And we have people who can go. We have interns with us, those who are preparing themselves for ministry in the long term, and we can send a small team. But I also want to appeal for four people, just four among you here, who would teach us and enable us and show us how we can go with our hands. What that means is if we can give even just a little, a million shillings, it may be a drop in the bucket. The UN is saying it's overwhelmed by the need of Syria. The, you know, countries of the Middle East like Turkey have been over flooded with, with, with these refugees. Europe itself is in a crisis because of the number of migrants who are going into Europe. And our little million shillings may be a drop in the bucket. But if it helps one person, if it brings some food to a little child, we did what we could in the name of Christ. And I want to ask for four people who will meet together and direct us and show us how to do this. Their work with the Castle de Barra Church, their work will be to mobilize churches in this country to give towards the Syrian Christians who are desperate for help from the church in Africa. That they would go and lobby government. I don't know that the government has funds for this sort of thing, but when we faced our crisis in 2008, other nations came to help us. Can we go and help others in their hour of need? I would believe the answer is yes. And we can begin the conversation. That we can go to even Syrians here who would be interested in doing something. That we can go to organizations and governments wherever we can, gather whatever we can, and work with Castle de Barra Church to make it available to even if it's one person in Syria. I'll be going to Egypt in two weeks because we have a number of conversations we're holding together. We know one another. We're developing a partnership so that we can plant churches around Africa together, particularly in North Africa and around the world. And so I'll be there in two weeks' time. And these conversations I will lead. But four people who would commit themselves to stand in the gap and guide us as to what to do. If you ask me, what are we supposed to do? I don't know. And so I'm asking for four spirit-filled men and women who will be guided of the spirit to show us what we can do and lead us in this work. Jesus said in Matthew 25 and verse 35, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. And then he goes on to say, I was in prison and you visited me. Or as I prefer to put it in this case, I was in a refugee camp and you visited me. And he went on to say, truly I tell you, just as you did it for one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it for me. Now let me say that not all is gloom in the Middle East. There are thriving churches even there that are living in the midst of persecution. And I want to share the story to conclude of one church that has been called the garbage church that is in garbage city. You'll understand when you see the video. It's a long one. It's about 10 minutes long. But bear with me as we watch it together. It has been said that life is a journey. A journey where one step follows the other and every step takes us into the future, to the unknown, to what is yet to be. No one fully understands the consequences of choices for the future. But sometimes, just sometimes, God pulls the curtain back and allows us to look across history and to see how he has masterfully orchestrated the events of humanity from antiquity to modernity. In these times of revelation, we see evidence of a God who centuries ago could hear the cries of a community of despised and rejected people. Those deemed the lowest in society, the Zebulun, the garbage collectors of Makwata Mountain. What 
Every morning at the crack of dawn, over 7,000 rubbish collectors leave Garbage City on horse carts or small trucks and move into the city of Cairo, where they collect over 13,000 tons of rubbish from nearly 17 million residents and return to the narrow streets of Garbage City, bringing the refuse into their homes. Here the women and children sort it into piles of organic and inorganic garbage. Organic garbage is used to feed the livestock that roam the streets or live on levels just above the people's homes. There was a time when it seemed as though life would never change for these people and no one cared because they were doing a filthy task, a job no one wanted. And then, nearly 30 years ago, one man did care. When I first came to Garbage City and stood at the first street, the homes were all made of tin. The people didn't have a chair to sit on. They sat on cardboard on the floor. There were no roads, no electricity or water. It was not fit for human life. The stench from the dead animals was horrible. But I was not really affected by all this. What affected me personally was the people who were in need of the grace of Christ. Everything else did not matter. The realization of the lostness of these people burned deep within Father Saman's heart. Right then, he determined to be God's instrument of change, and he would wade through pig pens such as this and literally pull people from the muck and mire and present them with God's love. When I went to invite the people to come and hear about God, they would hide in the pigsties. So I used to go in with sandals, but couldn't get my feet out of the mud. Then God told me to use boots. The second thing he told me was to take a torch because it was very dark. So I wore my trousers tucked into my boots and took my torch to find them. It was not easy for them to come. And God told me to take their hand and kiss their hand then kiss their head, and if they did not want to come still, I would take shoes and put it on their feet, and that would really shake them, and then they would come with me. All this I learned from the Holy Spirit, who taught me how to work in this area. Today, Suad, Father Saman's wife, daily covers this city in prayer. But there was a time when she knew the high cost of obedience and personally needed to hear the voice of God. When God first called me to serve here, I really needed to hear the clear voice of the Lord. I was in a first-class company in Egypt and had a high salary. And so, for six months I prayed and did not make a decision until I personally heard the voice of the Lord. Slowly, lives began to change as Jesus' teachings became a reality in the lives of these people. We were lost in hell. We were drowning in sins, so we thank God now we know Him. We worship Him and Jesus lives in us. We guide people and visit them in their homes, and we tell them how we were living in sin and how He changed us, and we thank God. As this community sorts through tons of garbage, they often find items which have great worth. And each discovery is an opportunity to put God's word into action. There was a lady whose husband was traveling and working hard for three years. She kept the money and brought jewelry, bracelets and gold crosses, and she put all this into a bag. When we found it, we said, we must take it back to the owners. Where does this honesty come from, she asked. Our Jesus taught us to be honest. Years ago, I stole an expensive vase from a lady whose garbage I was collecting. Then I met God and he started dealing with me and I started praying. I went to confess to Father Simon. 
He said, Now go, take it to her, and tell her that you never knew Jesus when you did it, but now that you know Jesus, you are bringing it back. As the number of believers began to grow, it became evident that the Zebulun would need a place to worship. And in 1986, when a workman dropped a rock to the ground and it fell into a natural cave, they knew that God had answered their prayers. Father Simon personally supervised the moving of centuries of rubble that lay in a cave carved out by the pharaohs, who had used Maquatum rock to build the Giza pyramids. Many rebuked him for working so passionately and mocked him with questions of whether the stones mattered more than souls. But Father Simon was simply preparing a place that would one day seat over 20,000 people. He was on a mission with God, and his every decision was taken in simple obedience. Obedience is better than sacrifice. When I make a sacrifice without obedience, it means nothing. Over the last three decades, many miracles have happened on Makwata Mountain. Tin shacks have been replaced with brick buildings. The streets have been paved. And yet, the children still play amongst the rubbish. But now they have a future, because true transformation is taking place. Signs of this transformation include the building of schools, clinics and churches, all right in the heart of Garbage City. Vocational school includes classes teaching sewing and knitting. Each item made has a value and a use, like this burial shroud, which will be used in the coffins that the young boys are taught to make in woodwork classes. Despite the appearance of excessive amounts of garbage, there is a creative system of sorting in place. Plastics, metal and paper are gathered and transferred to large bales that are lowered from rooftops and taken into recycling rooms. Here the plastics are melted and used for recycling. Despite the strong stench of burning plastic, the people are eager to work, turning the garbage into usable items. Today, walking the streets of Garbage City, people still flock to Father Saman and his colleagues, who gently move with love and compassion amongst the people. Father Saman is often inundated with requests for prayer and healing. This work requires great faith. And God often reveals himself in miracles and signs and wonders. Delivering the oppressed and possessed is almost a daily occurrence on Makwata Mountain. And as people find freedom in Christ, they begin to find beauty in the ashes. Despite an ever-increasing demand of his attention, Father Simon never compromises, enjoying his time alone with God. A garbage collector's job is to collect garbage from Cairo, so when one of them knows Christ, they become a light to the world, without even evangelizing his life as a testimony. Ever the visionary, Father Simon frequently retreats to the deserts outside Cairo where he shares his vision of building a church that will seat 5,000 and a retreat center where the Zebulun can leave the squalor of Garbage City and enjoy the open spaces. Despite the scorn these people face, 
Father Saman firmly believes that garbage city people will be used by God to turn the heart of Cairo to the Lord. We cannot reach all the people because we are so limited. We only have masses and meetings in our churches. But those garbage collectors can reach all the people. God has chosen them to be a blessing for Egypt. And he said, Blessed be Egypt, my people. As the sun sets over Makwata Mountain on a Thursday evening, the garbage collectors leave the rubbish in the streets and move into the grounds of the cave church. Here they gather for a time of teaching and preparation for ministry. Someone told me not to just think about myself as a garbage collector, because in Jesus my value is great. So now I'm an evangelist and the nations come to me and I can tell them how Jesus changed my life. Changing lives and pointing them to the Father is the goal of Father Simon's life, who has become as dear as an earthly father to the people of Garbage City. He is their arbitrator and confidant. He is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. He is their spiritual leader and companion. But to God the Father, he is simply a man who has lived a life of obedience and whose daily prayer, more of you and less of me, has been answered. This is our time to change our world. We need to cry, to scream, to travel and groan. We need to pray day and night, and the Lord will support this work with the Holy Spirit. But we're not just talking about Jesus in words, but also with miracles which will follow our faith and the world will see and believe and come back to Christ. Even in the midst of the persecution in the 1040 window, God is still on the throne and the gospel will prevail and the gates of hell will not win over it. Would you rise to your feet and allow us to talk, to pray? Father, thank you for stories such as these from the front line that confront us about our own faith and whether we have truly learned what it means to die to self that we may live for you. We pray that as we try and engage in some little way that you would give us four people who have compassion and conviction in their heart and are willing to sacrifice the time necessary and the effort to listen to your spirit and to guide us as to how to respond. For all of us, make us faithful to pray for our brothers and sisters and give us hearts of generosity that would respond with compassion. As we go out into our week, Lord Jesus, would you go with us and grant us wisdom and strength for what lies ahead of us. May our testimony as we live it out bring glory to your name, that those who see it would know that we are different because Christ lives in us. We ask your blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.